what I want to get back to is this, the conditions under which we find these megafauna. Um, and there seems to be some consistency there, and I brought this up last week. We'll, we'll look at this one here. Um, and this, this is just an example um, of literally hundreds and hundreds that I've collected together. Um, Brad and I, I guess it was 2001, we went up along the Bow River. We didn't go to this site, but we were up along the Bow River looking for, which is, which is a river that flows eastward out of the Canadian Rockies, out onto the prairies of Alberta. And what was interesting about the Bow River was it was apparently a conduit for, for massive meltwater floods. And so we were looking to document a ripple train that has been uh, observed up there on the, uh, on the gravel terraces along the, the Bow River. But what's interesting about those gravel terraces is that they have served to be a repository for many of these extinct mammals from the late Pleistocene. So uh, in this case, this was, um, goes back to 1968. Um, C.S. Churcher, this was published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. And I'm sure everybody listening has probably are regular readers of the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. Um, so here's what it says. This is the gravel deposits on the second major terrace above the north bank of the Bow River at Cochrane, Alberta, have been known by the local inhabitants to yield the bones of large mammals. Now, in this terrace, we're talking about gravel deposits. We're talking about flat, shelf-like features that flank the present-day river. And these flat um, features are composed of gravel, right? Uh, and when they say gravel, that also includes boulders. Now, you know that the, 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 the transition between a gra gravel and boulder is about 12 inches. I think that's about the size of a soccer ball, right? And once you get to 12 inches, you're now talking about a boulder, not gravel. But embedded all throughout these, um, these gravel deposits are much larger rocks that would be categorized as boulders. So anyways, they're talking about these terraces. And, and, and we'll, we'll explain here how, how these terraces work when we get to, uh, into the episodes about mega floods, right? We'll explain the, the genesis of these flat terraces and, and these shelf like you, you almost have to picture the modern river, but then there are these flat shelf like features. Uh, sometimes they can be a single pair, sometimes they can be multiple, two or even three pairs of these shelves, right? And they are composed of gravels and they are a legacy of uh, uh, enormously augmented flows through these, through these valleys. So this, the gravel deposits on the second major terrace above the north bank of the Bow River at Cochrane, Alabama, Alberta, not Alabama, have been known by the local inhabitants to yield the bones of large mammals. These bones have been recovered from two series of pits, that's gravel pits, you know, they go in and you quarry the gravel and you use it to make primarily concrete out of and road building and so on. So when they're, when they're excavating these pits in this gravel to recover this gravel, what they do is they keep finding the remains of these extinct animals. And it is from these pits that the materials described here have been obtained. The body of an axis is recognizably from a small equid, that's a horse. The specimen is water-worn and lacks all of the neural arch. Now, and here's, here's the critical part. Carbonized patches are present on the right side of the odontoid peg and on the body, we're just talking about these are technical terms for the bones, which indicate possible scorching by fire. Remember the example we cited towards the end of our, our last podcast was a, a mastodon remains that also had evidence that looked like it was scorched by fire. The bones were scorched, actually, right? And, and the suggestion was that the bones were scorched when the flesh was still on the carcass, right? Which means you're talking about a pretty hot fire. Carbonized patches are present on the right side and on the body, which indicate possible scorching by fire. The distal end of the right humerus has been worn away and discolored to a deep, or reddish brown suggesting the effects of fire. The presence of carbonized, scorched, and charred areas on the axis and within the cancellous bones of the humerus indicates that fire had touched the bones, the most likely resulted from a forest fire. The lack of associated charcoal 
suggest water sorting of the bones and ashes. Now, right there, I think in that case, which can be uh, replicated many times over, we find the evidence of two, two things, two forces of nature at work, fire and water. Now, how does it end up in the gravel deposits? Well, those gravel deposits are the, re, the, 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 the consequence of floods, giant floods, right? These gravel deposits that form these terraces are not being eroded or created today. They are fossil features in the landscape. The present rivers are merely wending their way through this ancient landscape and doing very little to modify it. But once you understand the genesis of these landscapes, you realize that they were created in a geological eye blink and that they were created under catastrophic circumstances, right? So here we now are finding these remains, these, skeletal, these skeletalized remains in these gravel deposits and they show evidence of having been scorched by fire. So what we have here is evidence of fire and water, right? Working together. How do you explain it? How do you, what kind of a scenario, other than just some randomized imaginary scenario, which could possibly be credible within a singular instance, but when you have multiple instances where you have remains of, whether it's vegetation or animals that look like they have been scorched by fire, but they are now found in flood deposits, how do we explain that? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem like there would be any normal circumstances that would result in that, especially not when they're in the bottom of some massive gravel pit. Yeah, they're they're in they're being dug up from right. It'd be one thing if they were really close to the surface and their bones were scorched. But you know, yeah. like you could imagine that they were They had to have been burned before they were deposited, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Because they're so deep in the gravel. Yeah. yeah. So the water came later and they were burned. So first. here I'll I'll I'll, I'll they, finish if they were burned that bad and they died on the surface, their, their bones wouldn't be all together in the, you know, they would have. Yeah, that's right. So you would say the bones would not be articulated. There you go. They would in fact be disarticulated. Disarticulated. disarticulated, right. Yes. Now you can add this one to your vocabulary, Kyle, and you can pull it out every now and then when you need to impress people. Yeah. <laughs> you can refer to some, something, this or that being disarticulated. Like my vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Or I was going to say perhaps like Russ is feeling a little bit disarticulated this evening. That's right. <laughs> Let me go on with this quote. Okay. The, it says that this most likely resulted from a forest fire. The lack of associated charcoal suggests water sorting of the bones and ashes. The wood ash and bone charcoal being carried further downstream. It must be concluded that the Cochrane bones derive from a number of individuals of five mammalian species and that they were all water rolled and carried downstream from where death overtook each animal before deposition in the gravel and sand beds. So they obviously weren't scorched by fire after they were water rolled and deposited deep in these gravel deposits. So they had to have been scorched by fire, probably killed by fire, then basically re moved and redeposited through floods that came subsequent to the fire. Uh, Randall, is there any dating on these bones? On this particular bones, I don't have the dating on this, but on a lot of them there are. And, it, and it, it's interesting that it seems like there are sort of a number of clustered dates. We not only find this kind of evidence um, most of it seems to be associated with the terminal extinction event at around 12 to 13,000. But we also find evidence that, for example, around 40,000 years ago, there seems to have been a massive event. You know, the, the, the Beresovka mammoth in Siberia apparently dates from about that time period, although I don't know if any accredating has been done recently. Um, I think based upon stratigraphic context, perhaps, I'd have to go back and review but, but there is um, evidence of, of more like episodic uh, type of episodes that could perhaps go back hundreds of thousands of years. The thing about the, what makes the Pleistocene-Holocene event uh, the most significant is because it was the most severe. 
And as we've talked about, I think you'd have to go back a minimum of 3 million, maybe as many as much as 5 million years to find an equivalent extinction episode uh, as the one of, say, 12 to 13,000 years ago. We could call it the Younger Dryas extinction.